네, 여러분 안녕하십니까? 2021 제주 포럼 사회를 맡은 아나운서 최송입니다. 박... I'm MC for today's session. 최송이. The session of US China supply chain competition and East Asia's choices will begin. Then I'd like to introduce the moderator of the session, Professor Yu Sang-yong from Graduate School of International Studies at Yonsei University. He is now the professor at the Graduate School of International Studies at Yonsei University. He is also the editor of East Asia Policy Dispute. He received PhD in politics and economics from Yonsei University Graduate School. He served as visiting researcher of Japan Skeio University, and also he served as the visiting professor of Columbia University, British Columbia University and Toronto University. Professor Yu, please take the floor. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. The title of the session is U.S.-China Supply Chain Competition and East Asia's Choices, Opportunities, and Challenges. These days, we are living in the era of uh, the uh, globalization, and we're in the midst of the U.S. and China competition over supply chain. So this topic is very timely considering the current circumstances. While preparing for the session, we asked common questions to the panelists. Would you upload the PowerPoint slides? We have three questions. First question, to what extent will the current competition in global supply chain persist? between the U.S. and China, and where can we locate a space for cooperation? So, will this ongoing discussion on this topic will be helpful for the relevant countries and the global economy? This is the first question. Second question, in what direction would the conventional supply chain formulated around East Asia's main industries and technologies be reorganized, including electric vehicles, semiconductors, and so on? So in order to proceed with this process successfully, what kind of market rules and international consensus are required? Third question, we're now in Korea. Korea might have a lot of opportunities and challenges in the situation of US-China competition over supply chain. So how can Korea overcome the current situation and come up with positive outcome? So what kind of strategies does Korea need? These are the three questions asked to panelists. Each panelist will make comments for about 10 minutes answering the questions, and we will have Q&A. But we need to have more specific discussion about the topic. To proceed with the panel discussion in a more productive way, I provided basic data sets. So I'd like to introduce to you some data set to make the panel discussion more productive. So as you see here, between China and the US, you have the topic of today, electric vehicle battery, IT and semiconductor. They, it compared the competitiveness between the US and China in terms of electric vehicle battery. China has overwhelmingly higher competition, competitiveness and as for AI, the number of AI researchers are much uh, larger in China than in the US. In terms of renewable energy, there are differences among China, the US, and other Asian countries. As for 5G technology, the technology gap is has appeared in recent five years between China and the rest of the world. This slide shows the technology competition between the US and China. This slide explains well why there is techni technological competition between the US and China. This is rare earth element supply. From China's perspective, China will be eager to use this slide, I think. In terms of the amount of production of 
of the resource, especially, for example, the, the rare earth elements, China has much larger production capacity. And the Korea and other countries, including the US, are highly dependent on this uh, resource for China. And this is the situation of South Korea. In terms of international trade, as of 2020, Korea is dependent on the trade with China for 26% of the economy and 14% of the economy is dependent on the US. And in the recent Korea-US summit, they decided to execute large amount of investment. These four companies on the slide, for these four major companies, the trade with China takes up a large proportion in the total revenues generated by these companies. So these data sets, today we have the, the best experts. So these data sets could be used as the ground for productive discussion today. So we have invited four experts. At first, first of all, we have James Kim, the president of Amcham Korea. He also served as the president and CEO of GM Korea. And in terms of inter-Korean issues and the U.S.-Korean alliance, James Kim is playing a very important role bridging the two countries. And he will give us very insightful presentation. Secondly, we have Dr. Ding Yipan from China. He is serving as the principal researcher, senior fellow researcher, at Thai Institute, and he is also um, serving as the Vice President of World Development Institute of Development Research Center. In China, there is very active think tank. He represents such think tank in China. And so far, he has been exchanging his opinions with our East Asia Foundation. Thank you very, very much for your contribution so far. And the third presenter is Mr. An Jung Sung, a lawyer, attorney at law from the state of Maryland. He is also an expert in Korea US FDA. He has provided very meaningful advisory regarding FDA issues and regarding Tesla. He's going to give us very insightful presentation and comments. Lastly, we have Mr. Ha Won Soon, the editorial writer of the Korea Economic Daily. He provided advisory to the Korean government and many companies in Korea. So I have high expectation for his comments as well. So each one of you have 10 minutes for making comments. I'd like to ask you to answer the questions and then we will take questions from the floor and you can share answers and questions with each other. We have James Kim. Please welcome him with a big round of applause. Exciting to have a, an event of this nature. Uh, what a great island, Jeju Island is. So I'm so happy that uh, we're all able to travel a little bit come here, meet some people in person. So personally, I'm very, very excited about being here today. Uh, as the professor mentioned, let me just give a couple of uh, comments on the three questions that uh, he had posed. I think this is a really exciting you know, time for, for countries and for companies. And the countries and companies that do a great job now in transforming, they're gonna be winners. And which is the reason why I think this topic is really, really interesting and important. I think that when you look at COVID-19, uh, it has led to a new normal in many aspects. And I think the new normal is here to stay. And I think what it has done a lot is, is really talked about the importance of diversification. I think that the professor talked about one of the slides 
where 26% of all Korean exports go to China and 12, 13% go to the United States and gets distributed to a lot of different countries of that nature. But I think diversification is going to be really, really important. Uh, as a business person, and this is not about an anti-China story at all, uh, when you put 26% of all your eggs in one basket, I think it's a challenge. Uh, I would not want to put that kind of a burden on any supplier or any customer. So I think from that perspective, further diversification is going to be very, very, very important. And I think that's the reason why this topic on supply chain becomes really significant. The other is uh, digital transformation. And obviously things like video conferencing and cloud, uh, they made it easier for people to connect. So now the whole world has become closer and those who know how to use technology properly and use it can really make it uh, a powerful opportunity to do more business together. In fact, when you look at the current semiconductor shortage today, it's a good example. Uh, because of uh, COVID-19, social distancing, digital transformation, they really uh, increase the demand for electronics. And not just electronics, but cars and game companies and consoles and many other products. So as a result, you're seeing a pretty big shortage of semiconductors. And when you look at companies like Qualcomm, they're what we call fabless company. So they, they design semiconductors. And then you have companies like Samsung, Samsung Foundry who actually produce them. So these types of uh, companies are really, really important. And for Korean companies to meet their demand, especially in the U.S., I love the fact that they're investing more in, in the U.S. In the recent uh, summit between President Biden and President Moon, I believe uh, the four big Korean companies invested $40 billion or have made a commitment to do so. And Samsung alone is $17 billion. So we feel that uh, that's a very, very good uh, opportunity for Korea to further diversify into major markets like the U.S. I think that a lot of these companies have already diversified into many of the southeastern countries as well, Asian countries from Vietnam and Indonesia. And I'm hearing a lot of uh, interest, even with uh, South American companies, they want to do more business with South Korea. So again, I think diversification is going to be very, very important. So how do you really optimize these opportunities? And I think for countries, you need to really understand what global standards are. So countries who can do business on global standards, they're going to be the winners. And the more unique standards you have in Korea, I think it poses a challenge for more investment opportunities. Uh, you know, when you look at, uh, for example, in Korea, uh, I think that Korea, this is a great time for Korea to establish itself as a regional headquarter here in Asia uh, because of the need for diversification. Uh, at AmCham, for example, uh, we have eight or nine board of governors who are actually running Asia from Korea. So it's a powerful, you know, testament. But I also let the Korean government know that there are some issues and challenges that if we can do a better job, uh, I think this is a good time to do that. And as a result, Korea can be the regional hub in, in Asia that can make it so much easier for U.S. multinational companies operating here and for other companies here in Korea as well. And lastly, uh, I just want to talk about uh, how digital transformation and green growth could be very important. Uh, you know, because of digital transformation and the U.S. companies are certainly leading the way, uh, with the exception of maybe one or two uh, European companies that are in this space, take a look at U.S. companies like Amazon, Microsoft, Facebook, these are all involved with digital transformation. And it really helps allow for more of the diversification play. And even Korean companies like, like Coupon and CJs of the world, they're in the space as well. So they're also going to be a big uh, winner here in this space. So just in closing, this is such an important topic today. Uh, and companies need to accelerate their digital transformation. In fact, when I talk to the board of governors of AmCham, uh, and many of them are obviously in the high-tech sector, 
in the e-commerce sector, even despite the, uh, the COVID-19, they are doing really, really well because they have uh, accelerated their, their transformation to digital. So those companies that have done it, this is a gold mine opportunity. So I hope that through this panel discussion we have uh, today, Professor, we could have a lively debate on, uh, on what we can do together to at least help Korea establish itself as a regional hub in Korea, in Asia. And uh, I know we have our friends from, you know, from other parts of the world joining us as well. So I look forward to a lively debate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Diversification of supply chain. From this perspective, he talked about the relationship, cooperative relationship between the US and Korea, digital transformation and green growth. Today's topic is competition between US and China over a supply chain. Regarding this, we'd like to listen to the presentation from China, from Mr. Ding Yifan and then have panel discussion. And Dr. Ding Yifan, thank you very much for your participation. You have 10 minutes for comments. You already gave us your talking points, but I'd like to ask you to make your comments for 10 minutes. Okay, my topic would go, what can be done to rebuild the East Asia global supply line? Because uh, when you talk about uh, spring time uh, between uh, China and the United States, well, it's a global uh, production chain. The global uh, production chain uh, has been contested both by the Biden administration and, and by the majority of uh, Republican congressmen and, and the senators in the U.S. So uh, uh, while uh, the East Asia global supply chain was focused on the U.S. and the EU, EU market first, so those kind of dispute between China and the United States could have tremendous impact on the redistribution of these uh, East, East Asia global supply chain because uh, that's the first time that these uh, supply chain will be uh, concerned about, about the, the future. So uh, I will make only four points about this. The historic context of globalization because East Asia uh, global supply chain has been built because of globalization the second point will be uh, the concerns about China's rise. And, and the, the third point will be, could the history repeat itself? And the, the fourth point will be only elements that might be neglected in the U.S., uh, in the U.S.-led historical bifurcation, because the U.S. wanted to decouple with China. So with, uh, with China means with uh, East Asia global supply chain. So uh, could this happen uh, and what could we do about this? Uh, the, the Eastern Asia global chain uh, has been built a long time ago, since 1980s. Uh, we should not forget that all these has been uh, led by uh, a social turbulence in the United States, in, in the Western Europe in 1970s. In 1970s, well, there was a lot of strikes and class struggles in the streets, uh, as we witness sometimes uh, nowadays in the United States in the 1970s. So to fight with these, when uh, Ronald Reagan and Nolan Sasha came to power, they engaged a conservative revolution both in the United States and the UK. And then they decided to deregulate the market and, and, and then uh, something happened. That's uh, the dislocation of production. So much of these uh, industrial production that used to be concentrated in Europe and in the United States, dislocated uh, towards East Asia, especially towards Japan, towards uh, Korea, and towards all these ASEAN countries. And then uh, something happened in, in the middle of 1980s. That's the Plaza Accord. 
Japan used to be the biggest producer of these industrial goods for the global market. I mean, global market means the European and the American market. Uh, while after the plus accord, the yen has been uh, appreciating so much that uh, the Japan has to uh, diversify its uh, risk of a change rate and uh, to 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 lower uh, the risk of inflation, to lower the cost of production. So Japan decided to dislocate some of this production uh, from Japan to Korea and to ASEAN countries. Uh, so that led to the so-called flying geese paradigm led by Japan. And then that created in the 1980s, uh, especially in the second half 1980s, the so-called Asia Miracle. Asia Miracle was a label of the World Bank about uh, what happened in East Asia. And then uh, the Asian crisis happened in 1997 because of the uh, strong success of this Asia Miracle. And then China joined the East Asian global supply chain uh, after the Asian, uh, East Asia crisis. And that's the second point. Uh, and then uh, all of a sudden, when China joined the East uh, global supply chain, uh, everything changed. Because China is this, a tremendous economy. Since they joined the WTO, uh, China's uh, GDP growth was so far that from uh, the year 2001, where China joined the WTO, and to 1920, to, to 2020. So in 20 years, China's GDP has been multiplied by more than 15 times. And then, furthermore, China's industrial output has been multiplied much faster than that. In 2018, China's uh, industrial added value almost, almost matched that of the United States, uh, Japan, and Germany put together. And then uh, in 2020, last year, because of the COVID-19, because of the pandemic, China's industrial added value is larger than that of those uh, uh, most uh, industrialized countries. So, so China became a very active player in the region, promoting regional cooperation and free trade arrangements. So China has become a major player in the uh, Asia, uh, East Asia-based uh, global supply chain. So that caused a lot of concerns. The third point is that the United States were very concerned about the rise of China, about the Chinese uh, ro role in the East Asia supply chain. So he wanted to repeat uh, a sort of cold war with China in order to disrupt the Eastern supply chain. Uh, then they, they wanted to, to promote so-called a decoupling uh, with China. They wanted to uh, bring their enterprises back, bring uh, even foreign companies back to the United States, while all these will create a lot of uh, problems even for macroeconomy of the United States, but that will put the East Asian countries in dilemma. <coughs> so could the US win another Cold War with China, which unlike the Soviet Union, is deeply embedded in the East Asian global supply chain, while at that time during the Cold War between Soviet Union and uh, uh, the United States, the Soviet Union was not within a global supply chain. So that's the biggest uh, difference is between China and, and the Soviet Union. So uh, could this uh, do this? But, you know, uh, in international relations, sometimes the decision makers, they are uh, trapped by the, uh, the past experiences. So they wanted to repeat the success of Cold War engaging with uh, the Soviet Union. So they wanted to repeat the success, uh, the success of the Cold War. They said they could repeat uh, the Cold War with China. They will force China to give up. Well, that uh, will be a total mistake because uh, there is uh, some elements that might be neglected by the United States 
uh, who led so the called uh, this kind of historical defragmentation. You know, they wanted to decouple with China to create two system or two global supply chain system. So uh, well, let's have a look at these. Uh, China's position in global supply chain and its contribution to preventing global cost push inflation uh, might be neglected by the US because even since the last crisis in 2008, if the United States or European Union uh, might uh, get out of the, the crisis faster than previously uh, in history, it's because of this globalization, it's because of the East Asia global supply chain. And, and nowadays, if they really decouple with East Asia, with China, and then with East Asia, that cr could create a lot of problems for these. Uh, and then the second element that might be uh, neglected by the United States is uh, the size of the market. Last year, in 2020, China's domestic market, China's consuming market, China's uh, detail sale market, China's domestic market have overpassed that of the United States to become the biggest consuming market in the world. That's something very important. Even for Korea, you have, you have to take into account the difference between those markets because China's domestic market is a rising market. Uh, and, and while in the United States, to some extent, the consumer marketing uh, market is a declining market. Then the RSEP. The RSEP Korea and China uh, are both members of the RCEP. RCEP's advance will allow East Asia countries to better restructure the global supply chain and enhance the region's competitiveness. So, you know, when the world was divided in mainly in two, three supply chain, East Asia uh, global supply chain, European supply chain, and North American supply chain, only the Eastern uh, Asia supply chain is the most, uh, the strongest and the most uh, dynamic. And then with our set, this uh, East Asia global supply chain will even become uh, stronger because of this. And, and then uh, China has adopted a dual circulation development strategy that will provide good opportunities for East Asian countries, especially for Korea. But the odd is that most of the Korean companies will be threatened by the United States long arm jurisdiction. So one you, in your uh, supply chain uh, strategies, if you are involved much more into the Chinese market than, than into the United States market, then we'll use Judicial army, judicial arms, judicial weapons to fight with you. Uh, recently, even in Europe, uh, some companies have to pay huge fines because uh, their behaviors or their investment, their cooperation uh, in, in Iran, in, in, in Russia uh, uh, have been considered as uh, in contradiction with uh, the United States rules. So that's, that's something very, very dangerous in the future. So Korean firms should be forced to constantly choose between the US and China, unless the evolving inflation pressure might force the United States to change its position with China. If you look at this, the United States is changing somehow its position vis-a-vis -vis China because recently it left the ban on WeChat, it left the ban on TikTok, it left the, uh, the, the, the ban on what else, uh, on Chinese technology, to, uh, oh, on the ban of cheap sale to Huawei, to, to, to Chinese uh, telecommunication companies. Uh, so Qualcomm uh, in competition with Samsung uh, is now allowed again to sell the chips to Huawei. So all these signals uh, we received from the United States show that they have uh, trying to change the processing with, with regard to, to China because uh, 
I think that to some extent, the rising inflation pressure uh, since uh, uh, April and May, the rising inflation pressure may force the United States to change their mind because that's something very, very important. In conclusion, because uh, I, I don't have a lot of time. So in conclusion, I will say that the globalization that brought economy prosperity in East Asia has been caused by political consideration, considerations in Western world, in uh, Europe and in the United States. And the current political pressure in the Western world might also change the historical trajectory as well. Unless the cruel reality forces them to give up the full-fledged campaign against China. No techno uh, technical solutions can be prevent such a disaster unless Eastern Asia firms join hands with American and European firms to lobby American governments and politicians to change their mind. Uh, actually, finally, if the US Congress and the Biden administration change a little bit, they are mind about China, uh, their, uh, their, their fight against China is because of the huge intervention from American companies and little bit by European companies. And then I think that to some extent, Korean firms should also join hands with those American and European firms to try to persuade the US Congress and US politicians that only the maintenance or the improvement of the Eastern Asia focus, the global supply chain, will bring more prosperity, will maintain the, uh, the balance of uh, global prosperity uh, in the world. Otherwise, uh, if they really wanted to destroy the uh, global supply chain, and then the world economy might be involved might be implicated into a deep recession. That's my, my, my explanation. Thank you very much. 네, 네, 네. 김일범 박사님 감사합니다. Thank you very much for your presentation. So you pointed out very impressive points during presentation. We will talk about specific uh, points during discussion session and supply chain of East Asia will get stronger and Korea is under the pressure to choose one between the US and China and thirdly we have presentation to be made by attorney An Jun Song he is going to present Korean perspective so as for technology The trade order, including technology trade, will be uh, under the influence of international trade um, agreements. He's going to make comments from Korean perspective. Then I will show my slides. As Professor said, I will have I will show different perspective in the perspective of Korean government and I will deal with the trade issue and Tesla's safety standard issue. I will propose a different perspective. And there like Biden's by American initiative was launched. And there is there are two points like trade union and made in America parts. And then I will touch upon the policies of Biden administration. And also I will talk about the supply chain policy of Tesla. And there was a car exclusion incident of Tesla in Seoul and through Korea, Korea's FTA the case was applied by the U.S. federal law. And while in conclusion, I will touch upon like the electrical vehicle st safety standards. 
and the battery and electrical vehicle, all technologies were combined. And I think Korea and the U.S. could work together in that section. I will touch up on that as conclusion. It was January 27th. The U.S. President Biden signed an executive order to address climate change. The title include climate change. However, in like substantially, it would to create quality jobs, and also it wants to promote clean energy technology and developing electrical vehicle. And it has two major effects like two goals in the long term to establish a carbon pollution uh, in the short term to supply pollution free clean automobiles to the US federal government. And there was a realistic issue. Actually, this policy is based on the by American policies. Uh, it was very similar to the policy made by Trump, the Trump administration. Then uh, procurement market, then the foreign companies could be excluded. What is special here is that after two days since the, the signing, the Bloomberg criticized the administration's plan. And the, there are two factors like about labor union and about American made parts. The Bloomberg criticized it because the clean energy policy is groundless. And there are three electrical vehicle manufacturers in the U.S. However, there are there is no company to meet the factors and requirements by the Biden administration regarding labor union and American-made parts. As you know, Tesla, uh, a representative electrical vehicle manufacturer. It could meet the requirement of American made parts, but it failed to meet the requirement of labor union. But GM has labor union, but it used the parts from other country. So there is no country to meet the both requirements. And also Bloomberg added the parts, like 57% of uh, parts of GM bolt are coming from Korea. It's called GM, but parts are most parts are coming from Korea, we could say. And Nissan, it does not have labor union, it does not use American made, made parts. The within the broader framework of policy, this new plan is not realistic. In that regard, I many people think that Biden would change its uh, shift its policy uh, strategy towards supply, like in terms of supply chain, global supply chain. The U.S. is re experiencing reduction of competitiveness, so it's difficult for it to narrow the gap with other competitive companies. That's why Biden is taking that initiative and approaching. For Tesla, Tesla is a global company and it has its it is building its own supply chain. Uh, it is so the company is going against the Biden's strategy and direction. It has plant in Shanghai, in China. 30% of parts are coming from this Chinese factory. So Tesla has good relationship with Chinese government, the Chinese government. 
So for the U.S. government, Tesla is not a good company because Biden wants to establish its, establish its own global supply chain to gain competitiveness. But representative company Tesla in the U.S., it uh, made China as a East Asia hub, and it is manufacturing uh, vehicles in China. So it could add some burdens. In Seoul, the city of Hanam, there was an explosion of Tesla. It is like it happens often in the U.S. Before this incident, in Florida, there was a car accident of Tesla and a passenger death, and it the car exploded. And similar incident happened in Seoul. The car owner died because he failed to come out of the car. It could be an issue of uh, safety and trade. A uh, vehicle, when there is an accident, it could be very dangerous because of explosion and fire. With that incident, what should come first between the standards of the U.S. and the standard of Korea? The issue is that the federal law was applied to this incident. So for different types of collision, depending on whether the accident was frontal collision or side collision, the different laws can be applied. So after collision, after the impact is lifted, the door should be open. But according to the federal uh, regulation, there is no regulation like crush unlock. So when Tesla sells the car in the U.S., they comply with the U.S. regulation. So when there is an accident in Korea, Tesla vehicle is not applied with Korean regulation. Although Korean vehicles are supposed to be equipped with crush uh, unlock, but that does not apply to the American vehicle because that is applied with American regulations. And Korea US FTA, Korea EU FTA, and Korea Canada FTA stipulate that the products from the Canada, US, or EU, if they meet the technology standards of Korea, then they will be applied with the equivalent equivalence regulation. The issue is that GM or Ford or other foreign car makers can bypass the application of Korean regulations. For example, in Mexico or in Canada, they can produce vehicles meeting the technological standard um, requirements of the U.S. And if they sell the car to Korea, and if there's a problem occurring from those vehicles, uh, Koreans cannot raise issues with that. So, so there's a problem related to uh, the sovereignty issues. And the existing FDA regulations stipulate that there are ways to solve such cases, but th in that case, we have the possibility of having trade dispute with the U.S. So um, from Korean perspectives, we are very careful in this issue. So from our experience of Korea US FTA, we need to be very careful. We need to review what kind of accidents or incidents may occur in the future, and we need to take a more delicate and sophisticated approach to such uh, trade agreements with other countries. Thank you for your presentation. The presentation of uh, Attorney An was related to the electric vehicle battery, electric vehicles and trade agreements.
So we listen to the presentation from three speakers, and Mr. Hall will make comments about the presentation. Please make sure you make comments in ten minutes. So before I make comments, I have something to say. I'd like to talk about my personal idea. So the season is beautiful, and we're in the island of peace. But we're talking about heavy and difficult topic. Last November. When the Biden administration was just about to be launched, we discussed the same topic, similar topic, and at that time last year we had a lot of worries about the confrontation between the U.S. and China, and the situation was quite complicated. And I today feel uh, regretful or sorry about the situation. Uh, first of all, if we look at the current circumstances. Whether it be supply chain or value chain, we don't need to make distinction between global supply chain and East Asian supply chain. I think that this is not the conflict over East Asia supply chain, but this is the conflict over global supply chain. If we say that it is the competition over East Asian supply chain, then that reflects、uh, overly reflects the view of, of China. And any treaty or convention says that economic cooperation will advance the peace and prosperity of humanity. So, GATT system and WTO were created, and according to WTO, whether it be value chain or supply chain. We came to have division of labor and specialization of labor, depending on the region, and we benefited from such systems. And China is, I think, one of the countries that benefited the most from such system. Of course, Korea benefited a lot from such、uh, global trade system, and the U.S. also came to talk about the new neo economy. And the supply chain、uh, through China helped the prosperity and growth of the world economy. And regarding the current situation and how are we going to solve the challenges we face now, we need further discussion. But for what the presenters said, I'd like to sum up the content. First of all, until last aut、uh, autumn. Until last November, for example, we were talking about whether we have to use the components from Huawei or, or not. But the confrontation over the supply chain developed into various directions. First of all, in terms of semiconductor, we have issues with supply chain. The second item is battery, electric vehicle battery, and thirdly, rail earth. Element and fourthly, vaccine and other medicine. These are all very important industries that are in the midst of conflict over the global supply chain. Biden mentioned the semiconductor big picture, so that is related to many relevant issues. And but the same is true for batteries. Korean companies and the U.S. companies recently agreed to invest four billion dollars. And as for rare earth elements, the pattern of conflict or confrontation between the U.S. and China is a bit different for rare earth elements. For these four categories, these are very important industries for the prosperity of the total、uh, whole humanity. But now we are. In the midst of conflict over supply chain of those industries, and the second point is that so far the U.S. and China had trade dispute and technology dispute and confrontation with each other, and the form of conflict they had was the conflict between the governments between the two countries. But now there is confrontation between the companies of the two countries, which is very worrisome. So companies are somewhat carried away by the government confrontation between the U.S. and China. That's、um, the second thing I see from the current context. 
Thirdly, so far, China has taken defensive approach. Until last year, China mentioned that the U.S. must fulfill the WTO spirit regarding trade barrier, investment, and trade technologies. China required that the U.S. lower the trade barrier. But nowadays, it seems like China is taking a more aggressive stance on this problem. So, so that's the trend I see from China's uh, position. And fourthly, Korean stance on this situation. I cannot summarize Korean stance on this uh, situation in just one sentence, but Korea works with the U.S. for security and Korea works with China for uh, economy. So that was the kind of strategy Korea has taken. But nowadays, the Korean companies are somewhat involved in the uh, confrontation between the U.S. and China. So how can Korea peacefully and wisely resolve these issues? And, uh, and uh, all of my comment is like important. I, I think I all agree with the presenter. And Mr. Ding Pan, uh, as he commented solution. And actually I have different idea with Ding Pan on the current situation, Ding Pan pointed out some Western issue, but I cannot, I'm not, I'm saying uh, we cannot uh, say that. And in terms of solution, China says that a semiconductor big picture of Biden, it is not a matter of just a simple choice. That's what I want to say. Uh, I did. I don't have enough time. Ne, thank you for your comment. Before having discussion, as a moderator, I would like to, uh, based on the question I asked, I will ask additional question to James Kim. I have three questions. First, currently the Biden administration's new policy, it was kind of strengthened the policy. Uh, would it success or not? Could you say that? And the second one, the private sector in the US, whether they are welcoming this policy or not. Actually, the, there are different uh, opinions about uh, interests between the nation and the government and the business. And the third one, the possibilities of cooperation with China uh, for the business, uh, business sector, where they could find some chances of cooperation with China. Could you answer to the three questions? You know, we still need more time to really understand uh, how the Biden policies will be impacting uh, the U.S. companies here, uh, not just in Korea, but also globally. One thing I want to say is that AMCHEM is a non-political uh, organization. Uh, we have worked uh, very closely with all the administrations uh, out here, and we feel that we will continue to work very well with the Biden administration. In fact, in fact, when you take a look at uh, most of the people that are part of the Biden administration, uh, they've been with us for a long time. A lot of career diplomats, uh, and I just feel that they will continue to do what's in the best interest of America and how it impacts uh, the different global allies. Uh, your second question was about what do the companies think? Uh, again, uh, a lot of people predicted that when Joe Biden became president, the stock market would have a negative impact. But quite frankly, it's had a very positive impact so far. We're at record highs today, and I do see a continuation of, of those policies. So again, let's wait and see. Uh, 
What was the last question you had for us? The possibilities of uh, cooperation with China for business, the U.S. businesses, private sector. You know, as a Korean American uh, whose passion is to help U.S. companies here in Korea succeed, uh, we want to make sure that uh, there is free and fair trade when it comes to U.S. and China. In fact, I think we should take a look at the long term. Uh, quite frankly, when you see the that incident that happened years back, we have seen how it could have a negative impact to, let's say, the Korean companies who are in, in China today. So those are some of the things that we should really learn from. And again, which is the reason why we're on record to talk a lot about diversification. 26% going to China from Korea is a is a very concerning situation, both from the customer side and from the supply side. So we feel that given the time we're at, you should really accelerate the diversification. And this is not an anti-China play at all. And I think American companies are very well positioned to do that because they've always had very good supply side, uh, supply chain management. And that's the reason why many of the American companies are doing really well, despite COVID. 네, 감사합니다. 어, thank you for your answer. Mr. Deng Ipan, Dr. Deng Ipan, I will give you a question. Four questions. Made in China. Uh, made in the first question is made in China 2025. Do you think made in China 2025 will be successful? Or these days there are many challenges. What do you think about the probability, the, how much percentage do you think that made in 20, China 2025 will be successful? Second question is related to the rare earth elements. The countries surrounding China have a lot of concerns over rare earth elements because China may use rare earth elements as a way to revenge against the U.S. in its trade dispute with the U.S. What do you think about this? And the third question is, in your cooperation with the U.S., which area do you think you can cooperate with the U.S.? And lastly, the Mr. Xi Jinping said he has the willingness to join CPTPP. How do you think the China's uh, joining of CPTPP will be proceeded with? Okay, thank you very much for your question. So, first of all, made in China 2025 is Chinese 10 years uh, development plan for science and technology. So we, every 10 years, we will get out with a, a, a scientific and technology development. So far, we are pushing uh, up this uh, scientific, especially technology development plan. Uh, and then we can reach the target of this uh, technology development plan. Uh, look, look at these. We have made uh, tremendous progress on all of these, on those technology especially high-speed uh, railway technologies. Uh, China is making rapidly progress on the high-speed railway technologies. Recently, we came out with a prototype of the next generation of high-speed railway. It could run as fast as 600 kilometers per hour. Uh, and then uh, the, the principle of the next generation of high-speed railway is totally different because next generation high-speed railway will not run on wheels. It will run by magnetic forces. So it's called a magnetic train. So, and then uh, the technology is completely mature, but uh, uh, you have to make the final decision because to commercialize these, uh, you need a lot of to input. You, 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 you need to have a lot of investment money. And then we have to think twice about it, maybe, uh, Given the current uh, transport volumes between Shanghai and Beijing, we may think about uh, building another line of uh, 
high speed railway with this new technology uh, in a few years. So in, in terms of, of, of quantum telecommunication, we are making also a lot of progress on these. This is also a target of the uh, meeting trend 2025. So, uh, and, and then uh, the recent uh, uh, progress we realized is about uh, uh, nuclear fusion uh, technology. Nuclear fusion technology is the uh, end game of energy. If we can solve these problems, we can solve the problem of lack of energy one for all. And then recently in uh, Ch China's uh, University of Science and Technology in Hefei, we made tremendous progress on these. Uh, and and, and, and these, although it's not, we cannot make it happen uh, before 2025, we think that uh, something like 2035, China could work out a, 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 a really commercialized uh, nuclear fusion uh, plant. That will be a, a tremendous progress in human history because after that, we can solve all these problem of uh, carbon emission, or we can solve all the problem of lack of uh, uh, energy. Uh, we can, because the, the, the nuclear fusion technology use not the, the, the materials where we use for nuclear fusion technology. So it's totally different. So, and then we may have uh, endless uh, energy for these. Uh, that, that's also progress we have made in, uh, along, in, in line with uh, meeting China 2025. So uh, I think that in, in, in few years ahead, China will make out more and more progress, both uh, in terms of science, scientific development and technology development. Mm -hmm. uh, with regard to rare earth, China have no intention to rail rare earth as a weapon, but, uh, either to punish its, uh, uh, to, to sanction its partner or to, 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 to make more money about this. No, it's, it's, we have no intention. We know that railways uh, are something very important for modern technology and for modern production, uh, especially for electric vehicles. Uh, that's an essential element uh, that the United States then makes the railways or Chinese uh, uh, control over railways as a, a menace, as a threat to the United States. Uh, but uh, did China use rail earths as a weapon to threaten uh, Korea or Japan? Never. We, we cannot use these kind of, uh, even we, we in, 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 some, in our dispute with Japan, China didn't really impose uh, really the sanctions against, against Japan with railways. But China really did for some time put some limit on Chinese railways export because we, we, we are aware that uh, the railways or to keep, uh, to keep an eye over Chinese uh, railways term. Uh, rail earth export is in Chinese interest uh, because uh, we know that uh, some countries are importing uh, railways at uh, lower prices in order to make a huge stock in the future. So we don't want to, uh, those countries to make these stock because of, of, of the railways uh, lower prices currently. So we, China, not only China has the, uh, the biggest uh, global reserve of, of railways, but also China possesses the technology of uh, distilling uh, the, the, to extract uh, a, a useful elements from railways. Um, in this regard, China's technology of extracting uh, railways is uh, far beyond the, the, the average level of the world. So I, I think that even if we look at 
at, at the market sometimes. They, the United States, as we're well, Australian people, they decided to make use of their rare earths, but they have to ship their rare earths to China in order to, to extract the useful elements from the, the rare earths because, technologically speaking, China's equipment and China's technology is more efficient uh, for, for extracting those, to, to distilling those uh, uh, rare earths. So that, that's something very important. Uh, in terms of uh, Sino-US uh, collaboration, I think that uh, in the past, to some extent, uh, China-US cooperation has avoided a global deep recession uh, after the 2008 financial crisis. And, and then uh, American people had short memories. They always forget the, the historical lessons. Remember at that time, there was a close cooperation between Han Paulson, who used to be a, a treasurer in uh, Treasury Secretary, and Wang Qishan, uh, Vice President, uh, and uh, very important, an expert uh, in, in, in financial sector. So their cooperation was essential to get the United States out of the uh, deep recession and the crisis. And the, the United States, the American politicians tend to forget the experience. I think to some extent, uh, in the next, months, if not years, in the next months, uh, as the United States uh, is facing a, a, a growing pressure, a growing inflationist pressure in their markets, they will come back somehow to China to try to find a, 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 a sort of cooperation to stabilize the prices, to stabilize the macroeconomy in the U.S. market. I think that the, the U.S. cannot get along of the next uh, next crisis, which is coming, is not far from from there. It, uh, the next crisis is coming, so to some extent, the U.S. will come back uh, to China very soon to try to find a solution of cooperation uh, in order to to avoid to be involved into a deeper economy recession. Uh, with regard to CPTPP, I think the Chinese leaders are sincere. Uh, with regard to every regional free trade uh, uh, and uh, investment agreement, the uh, Chinese in leaders are serious. They wanted to promote these. Look at uh, the negotiation uh, for, about uh, RCEP. Uh, one China would China could take advantage of current uh, WTO arrangement. So, but in, in some respect, uh, China is also eager to put forward the free trade arrangements in the region. We concluded uh, a free trade ar uh, arrangement with, you, with Korea, and we wanted to push uh, a free trade arrangement with Japan as well as you to create a triangular uh, free trade agreement with Korea and, and Japan, but because of Japan, the, the, the negotiation failed. Uh, and then we, we reached this free trade agreement and we upgraded the free trade agreement with ASEAN countries. So we wanted to promote the free trade agreement around uh, the region. And we think that uh, the, the freer the international trade in, in this region uh, the bigger the chance we have to uh, strengthen the global supply chain. Yeah, okay. Because okay. currently, uh, the international trade is closely related with the building of a global supply chain. It's not uh, we exchange uh, manufactured goods. No, we exchange only part of the manufactured goods in order to make a final good. So that's why a free trade agreement currently uh, nowadays is favorable to the rebuilding of a global supply chain. Uh, and in this regard, we are sincere to adhere to the CPTPP. Thank okay, you. thank you for your, for your answers. 
Next, I will ask a question to Mr. An Jun Song, Professor An Jun Song. In terms, like in Korean perspective, we were forced to uh, choose between the U.S. and China, and we say, do not force us to like, do not push us to make a choice. But we are actually in that situation. So Korea, what should it do? And about the uh, uh, like legal issue of Tesla. Do you have any recommendation for the Korean government? I will give you three minutes. For the first question, I thought a lot. CN, at the CNN, I saw, I remember a comment of Biden after meeting with Putin. He said, I'm not entire Russia. And I thought that comment a lot. Uh, what I understand is that uh, for Korean company, who is pro Korea? Like, who is your enemy? Before saying that, they uh, both side need to approach Korea as friends in terms of politics and in terms of economy. That's my personal idea about the trade, what the Korean government could do. It is very sensible issue. Trade issue could be expanded, that could get broader in issues. And there were some trade issue in terms of Tesla vehicles. And if we touch some small thing and it could uh, get serious into uh, bigger issues, but with, in a very broader framework, the government of China and the U.S., they need help from Korea in terms of strategy and in terms of economy because Korea's um, status has grown. If the two push Korea to the corner and it's difficult for them to see some wanted results, so I think in a bigger framework, we need to, they, the two need to communicate and kind of bigger deal is required for bo for both the US and China. Even though there are some minor issues, the two need to serve the problem. Actually, years ago, because of that, Korea had, had conflicts with China, but we have to make a big, like a kind of smaller deal from the beginning to promote communication between the two. Then I will ask Hwan Soon to give some comments about the talks. I will add some comments. Today's topic is U.S.-China supply chain competition. And I've heard a lot from the government officials. And uh, Mr. Ding Pan said that China is not intent does not intend to use a rare earth as arms. But what Korea, the Korean government's concern is that the, the China wants to have FTA with Korea, but towards Korea, I'm not sure that, what, I'm not sure whether China has kind of uh, very uh, favor uh, position to Korea. China is pushing Korea and putting some pressures on Korea. For example, there was thought retaliation years ago. I do not give you any the details, but as I told you, the biggest beneficiary of WTO is China. And uh, if China give uh, make us to makes us to believe and have some more trust on China Chinese government. I think we could uh, work together. And what I concern is that the U.S.'s administration Biden's administra administration's big picture. In that picture, security and economy is intertwined. And also we have 
the crisis of pandemic and all are intertwined in this issue. So we have to take time to look at, and it remains to be seen. It may, the situation may, makes Korea to, uh, the, the, it makes uh, the choice more difficult. And there are many uh, like intertwined elements in Tesla's issue. So the US and China, they have to take responsible attitude. And to James Kim, I will uh, give you some a few more minutes. Pardon. I just want to make uh, two very quick comments. I know that uh, Mr. Ding on his last uh, conclusion slide talked about how U.S. and European companies should get together and really lobby the U.S. government to make a lot of these things uh, kind of get resolved. I actually really believe in transparent conversations. So I actually think that the same should apply to U.S., European, and Korean companies and speaking to the Chinese government as well. So it can all be on the same you know, wavelength. And lastly, I think that it was very good to see Korean companies voting with investment dollars in the U.S. The $40 billion that uh, the Korean companies pledged during the recent summit between President Biden and President uh, Moon, it was pretty, pretty significant. And when I heard President Biden say, thank you, thank you, thank you, and had the four Korean executives stand up, that's a pretty powerful commitment right there. So I hope that that gives you a strong indication of the powerful relationship that Korea and the U.S. has, commercial, military, and cultural. And I hope that continues to get even bigger. 네, 감사합니다. 혹시 플로어에... Thank you for your answers. We will take some comments from the floor. Could you make your question or comments short? Question to the distinguished Chinese uh, the, the participants. Well, although you know, Mr. He mentioned that we need to make a distinction between the firms and the state, but in case of China, sometimes uh, especially big firms in China are basically state-owned, and whatever the Chinese government take action in terms of the macro or financial policies uh, tend to favor the big state-owned you know, enterprises. So this will result in the level playing field is indeed violated here. And uh, it, that's why the Western you know, country continue to raise the question of uh, direct subsidy from the government to state-owned enterprises uh, is in a big, big problem. This somehow needs to be you know, corrected and amended to following the, the market economic principles. Thank you. 네, 감사합니다. 시간이 거의 다 됐으니까. Thank you very much uh, for your comments. I would like to make closing remark. As moderator of the session, do we have time? Was that not comment but question? It seems to be difficult to ask all the questions to all panelists. The question goes to Dr. Ding Yifan, not to me. I also have my own idea, but the question is not for me, but for Dr. Ding Yifan. Professor Ding. Go ahead, yeah. So, yes, yes. The, the way China have uh, get, got a lot of criticism about, uh, about these uh, state-owned enterprises, uh, but it's a common sense. It's a common sense because uh, in all those later developers or in these uh, later developing, uh, developing countries, uh, the, they almost use somehow uh, state-owned enterprises, although uh, it's not the same shape or is not the same form of state enterprises. Uh, in Japan, uh, it's called Saibazu. In Korea, it's called Chaibao. 
and in China it's called uh, state-owned enterprises. It is not China is not an exception in the world economy arena. Uh, and, and the second, um, uh, those companies on the blacklist of the of the Biden administration or uh, the companies that are considered as a threat to the United States are not state-owned enterprises. Huawei is not a state-owned enterprises. Dajiang is not uh, a state-owned enterprises. Uh, China has created its own uh, its state-owned enterprises, uh, state-owned enterprises, especially in the sector of uh, public services. First of all, public services uh, we have a huge tremendous. Uh, uh, state-owned enterprises such as banks, uh, the biggest uh, Chinese bank, uh, banks are also uh, in these sectors. Uh, they are uh, listed as uh, uh, top 500 in the world. So uh, those uh, exception about uh, about uh, beside those uh, financial institutions, uh, uh, that's in the energy sector we find those uh, state-owned enterprises such. Uh, PetroChina or, or, or Sinopec, all these uh, energy enterprises. But those companies are not rivaling with most of these, uh, if not with some of these uh, American and, and European companies uh, in, in international economy. Otherwise, in Eastern Asia, they are not uh, a, a sort of threat to Korean or to Japanese companies. So uh, I think that when we are talking about uh, the competition uh, between China, Korea, and Japan, so uh, we should pay attention to the concrete, con concrete content of, uh, of discussion. Uh, while in the concrete uh, uh, competition fields, I don't see any competition between Chinese sustainable enterprises and Korean enterprises or Japanese enterprises. So that's my answer. 네, 네, 감사합니다. 그러면 지금 시간이 지나서 제가 간략하게 어, 마무리하겠습니다. So I will conclude the session. The political theory of each nations and market theory are all intertwined, and there is no possibility to narrow the gap between the each nations with changing policies. Many companies are making choices and they are very busy to make decision. In terms of battery, if all the vehicle manufacturers, they set their own policy and they declare that they would make their own parts. So the issue we are discussing is going to be very, becoming very complex issues. But I'm not sure whether if like even uh, in China and the U.S., it's diff like the anyway. It's very complex issues, so uncertainty is going to be going heightened. So the leader of businesses and the policy makers and decision makers, they have to come up with some solutions to for cooperation in a wise manner. We had very in-depth discussion and we have many participants in this floor. Thank you for your fruitful discussion. We will wrap up this session. Thank you. Once again, give all the participants here to a big round of applause. The U.S.-China supply chain competition and East Asia's choices is closing. Thank you, all participants and speakers and discussants. I'm MC for this session. Thank you.